very pleased to have John Pluger here as our guest speaker. Um, as I mentioned, it will be a different approach this afternoon. I'll, uh, I'll throw John some really hard curveball questions. No, I, I'm sure that uh, you'll all enjoy uh, listening to what John has to say. But to get started, we're going to watch an interview from last week's Paris Air Show that was aired on Bloomberg Live TV. So if you could roll the film for us, that'd be great. Thank you. And bring the lights down if you can. So 100 aircraft, yes. 27 of which are the new A321, the narrow body XLR. Basically, Correct. this can fly from the center of Europe all the way kind of into the middle of the United States. Exactly right. What do you see demand for that aircraft being? We see a huge demand for that aircraft. It's a natural complement to the A320-21 series. We were also a launch customer for the A321-LR, yep. and now we have the XLR, the extra long range. So the aircraft is a perfect complement and will add huge range capability. I think you're going to see this aircraft become highly, highly used transatlantic and between North America and South America. So already we have huge expressions of interest from many, many of our current Airbus uh, customers, 320neo and 321neos all over the world. And that's why we decided to make, uh, at this time, the uh, decision to launch this aircraft. It's a very natural compliment to us. We see huge demand. JetBlue is going to do transatlantic. There's yep. a lot of talk about low yep. cost, long haul across yes, the Atlantic. Yes, Are you yes. basically just front running that? Yes. Yes. Exactly okay. right. In, in terms of when we start to see that market seriously taking off, like what's the lead time? The, the aircraft's not going to be ready for a few years. Right. I mean, it, our, our first deliveries are at the end of 23, but predominantly they're in 2024 and 25. They run all the way to 2026. Do you see more of those aircraft coming on? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I think we're going to be very successful. I think uh, this is going to be a defining aircraft for middle to long range, um, efficient, environmentally friendly flying. You know, environmental sustainability is all also about efficiency. This airplane is hugely efficient compared to wide body aircraft that it might in fact replace in some of these marketplaces. And filling the aircraft with the right size, the right capacity, the most amount of people that you can get on that aircraft adds to that environmental sustainability and efficiency. So I think the world will uh, welcome this aircraft and I think the airlines are clamoring for it. How many Maxes have you got? So we currently have about uh, 140 matches on order, 15 in our fleet. We were supposed to get another 20 uh, by the end of this year, um, but then the aircraft got grounded. How's that affecting things? Look, it's tough for our customers, but uh, they are coping. We're helping them as much as possible finding interim lift. They've now largely met their lift requirements for the summer. And I think basically all hands and all eyes are waiting and watching on the regulatory oversight of yeah. the aircraft and the return to service. Uh, and primarily the collaboration between the US FAA, EASA, China, Canada. Uh, this has got to be a global reentry of the aircraft. And I think, um, I would hope, and I think the airlines hope that the regulatory authorities are all working collaboratively together. Uh, if there is one possible good thing out of this is I think rather than fractionating the regulatory process further, fragmenting it further, it's an opportunity for our regulatory authorities globally to come together in a new area of transparency and working together uh, to make sure this aircraft is absolutely as safe as possible when it returns to Do the sky. Do you get any sense from your customers though that, that their customers are worried about it? And as a result, yeah. Maybe, they don't, want, maybe yeah. they don't want them for a while. Look, I, I think most airlines are, are, are concerned about public perception. And, uh, you know, people know about the MAX. And yeah. uh, unfortunately, there were two horrifically bad crashes. Um, but I think, again, a transparent process with multinational regulatory authorities working in conjunction with a Boeing company, getting this airplane up and flying uh, to demonstrate absolute safety, correction of problems that were there. Over time, the aircraft will regain its place in terms of customer acceptance. But I do think initially, this is a concern for a lot of uh, CEOs of airlines and a lot of the flying public. You are a big leaseor to Chinese airlines. We are. Do you get any sense that the president's trade war with China is gonna have a meaningful impact on your business? So far, no. Uh, we're watching carefully, uh, just like everyone else. But we are a U.S. company. At the same time, we keep getting requests for proposals and requests for leasing of Boeing aircraft by our Chinese, air, by our Chinese uh, airline customers. We are delivering aircraft yep. uh, on schedule to the Chinese customers. Uh, so, so far through the leasing vehicle, which is what we offer, it's hard to see an impact, but we remain very watchful. Do, do, 
at, at the margin, you don't think you're getting more Airbus versus Boeing requests? No, no, no. It's 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 pretty uniform. And as a matter of fact, I think uh, what you would actually see is perhaps a little more requests on the Boeing side because yeah. I, de I think the demarcation for the Chinese airlines is right now no direct buys, no direct purchasing. But leasing is an avenue and a vehicle that, that will okay. provide the ability for, for Boeing aircraft to enter the marketplace and enter, that, enter China. Lufthansa stock down massively today. Mm. Profit warning, mm -hmm. there are too many aircraft flying in Europe. Mm -hmm. There is too much capacity in mm -hmm. Europe. Would that be your sense? Mm -hmm. And how do you think that's going to change? So capacity is something that rationalizes it ebbs and flows over time. Um, I know that Lufthansa put out this warning. Um, look, but I think at the end of the day, you've had you've had evolvement of airlines. We've had airlines go bankrupt in Europe. We will probably have a few more go bankrupt. It's the nature of this industry. If the airline cannot define its its market position, its niche, if you will, uh, broadly speaking, you have a class of low cost and ultra low ca cost carriers as opposed to the the legacy carriers. If you're somewhere in between, you have to be very, very careful about your strategy. And this is this is an evolving marketplace. So I do think it's the nature of the airline business that we probably will see some more failures over the next 12 to 18 months. Uh, we in the leasing community act as a great buffer for that because we take that lift, we take those airplanes, yep. and we put them other Good places on the globe. Again. And so, yep. you know, we, we provide a great buffer for the industry. And if we do that well, we can serve our customers well, and we can be profitable doing it. Do you think the, the Fed needs to cut rates right now to, to keep the the U.S. economy on track. To, I, what, what is your sense? Read the economic tea leaves. Or... Yeah, I believe the market has already priced in Fed rate cuts. Uh, I don't know how much, but you can see it in the bond prices and the spreads of various different companies, including ours. Um, so um, it would not surprise me if the Fed would cut uh, at least one or two more times by the end of the year. You'd welcome that? Well, lower interest rates are always good for our business. We're a capital intensive company, and so uh, we're a debt issuer on Wall Street. Um, Interest expense and depreciation are our two biggest expenses in our P&L. So naturally, uh, any further cuts in the interest rates are helpful to our business. Very good. Well, ladies and gentlemen, please <clears throat> join me in welcoming John Pluger to the stage. Thank you, John. Thanks a lot, Dave. <laughs> good to be back. Yes. Good to be back. Welcome back. Thank you, Thank you so much. Well, congratulations. Uh, a great week last week over in Paris. I can get my figures right, 100 single aisle Airbuses. That's a, that's a big kid <laughs> in a candy store right there. That's, uh, that's pretty neat, and including the launch, as you said, the A321 Neo XLR, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as well as 50 A220 300s, mm -hmm. and uh, what, five or six? Uh, 787. 787. So, well done. Like Christmas, right? <laughs> goodness. Well, you need a big checkbook. <laughs> yes, it's nice to have that. So there's many global macro concerns, obviously, and you touched on a few of these. The trade wars, the slowing global uh, economic growth, Middle East tensions, central bank policy. What gives you and Air Lease confidence in the future, though? Well, great. Uh, again, thanks for having me. Look, I think, I think amongst all these macro concerns that we read so much about today, we lose sight because we're focused on risk, but we lose sight of the most important fundamental aspect, and that is the resilience of passenger traffic all around the globe. It is the single most important thing that we look as at a company, both near term, medium, long term. It is the single, single most important thing that we believe in and have confidence in We'll talk about a few of these today. I offered up some slides that you can all kind of follow along, but there's some really key fundamental drivers of passenger demand. You all know of the emerging middle class uh, that's actually happening not only in, in, uh, in China and India, which are the two most cited countries, but, gen but globally. And that middle class is being perfectly fed, if you will, by lower and lower airfares globally, all around the world coupled with a huge expansion in city pairs being flown by low-cost and ultra-low-cost carriers and now also by legacy carriers as well, coupled with a huge growing preference in terms of discretionary income, the people globally are spending their money more on travel and experience as opposed to widgets and things and goods. So all these things uh, come together, but what it's resulted in is, is the world's airline industry 
has become the world's form of mass transportation today for anything over about 500 nautical miles. Uh, next slide, please. Um, it's had a huge growth historically. So just, we've just picked like a seven year period here, a change from 2011. Our global population went up about 9.4%. What about global traffic in terms of passenger kilometers? Not, not cargo, but on the passenger side, flat. Globally flat in that same year period. But if you look at global air traffic in revenue passenger kilometers, RPKs, which is how we measure ourselves, up almost 70% in that same time. And of course, maritime transportation across the ocean got supplanted by airliners uh, you know, in, 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 in the mid 20th century. century. So all of this uh, has led to the fact that we, the airline industry, has become the world's form of mass transportation for anything over about 500 nautical miles. It's interesting. For those that were here last month with John Slosser from uh, Cathay Pacific, delivered a very similar message mm -hmm. on, on what they're looking at with China and India and the, the growth of the middle class and their Absolutely. desire to travel. It's, yes. it, he's looking forward to an explosion over there. So I'd like to focus a bit on the global affordability kind mm -hmm. of along the same lines of air travel compared to other things because I think we take it for granted. So if you could put that into context for us. Yeah. I do think people lose sight of it. You've got every, we've all gotten used to cheap airfares all over the globe. But I think the degree of how cheap it really is is not focused on it, and, and it's a huge driver. I've got a little chart here. I do have a laser pointer. I hope I'm not going to get you there, David. But so look, we've just put up a chart showing the relative price change from 2000 on a lot of common consumer uh, issues and, 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 and ticket items. So this is based on the US. But I will say that these same uh, relative differences and trends actually are happening globally. The percentages might be a little bit different, but it's very much a global phenomenon. So let's look from the 2000. You basically hear in the states have disposable income that's riven, dri risen about 73%. Look at college tuition, something very much in the news of late, by the way, and um, admissions. But uh, he, I mean, Disney World, 150%. Home prices up 70%. Food, the very base, most basic of all commodities, up 49%. How about the consumer price index? 42%. How about public transit? Buses, subways, taxis, 26%. How about air travel? Only 14% compared to all of those other, uh, other different items. Next slide. Let's go back even further. Let's go back 40 or more years. So if you look at the left side of the chart, we put a, uh, uh, a little slide here. From 71 through 78, the US airline industry was under deregulation. And during that time period, we averaged about 5.7% compound annual growth rate. After deregulation, from 78 through 2016, 38 years, 38 years under deregulation, 1.3% compound annual growth rate per year for 38 years only. How about Disneyland, the Magic Kingdom? How about a price to a ticket? 1971, <coughs> $3.50. Today, 110 bucks, probably even higher now. I, I, I don't really know. So what's happened? That price to a ticket to Disneyland has gone up 31.4 times in, in the period since 1971, 48 years, 48 years. The US Consumer Price Index, only 5.9 times. But US airfare, and again, this is a, the, the US leads the globe in air transportation, so it's a global phenomenon only 2.4 times up in 48 years, in 48 years. I've got something I think is going to startle you. We all think that the low cost airline phenomenon started eh, 20, 25 years ago, Southwest, et cetera. Actually, it existed in 1950. Next slide, please. So in 1950, this is an actual ad from Icelandic Airlines, the precursor to Iceland Air advertising the lowest airfares to Europe in 1950. So you have four, round trip, now it's through Iceland, but round trip, 427 bucks to Norway, Germany, 460, whatever that number is. How about today, 48 years later, today, I'm sorry, 60, 60 years later today, United Airlines, round trip, Munich, San Francisco, $390. How about Norwegian, Rome, to, I think that's Kennedy, 159 bucks one way. 
How about on level, a European low-cost carrier? Barcelona, 129 bucks one way. San Francisco, 160. So 60 plus years later, 60 plus years later, we have lower airfares than they did in 1950. That's so interesting, John. <clears throat> Are we seeing this affordability replicated in other aspects of travel and transportation? And oh, absolutely. Next slide, please. So one of the things I mentioned at the beginning is we got some numbers here from the Brookings Institute. But, the, but personal consumption in the U.S. has about doubled in the last 15 years to 12.3 trillion. But the major aspect of personal consumer spending habits, not only in the United States, but now globally, is the shift in that spending habits, as I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, from goods and widgets to travel and experience. And Mark Dunkerley's sitting out here, he used to be the CEO of Hawaiian Airlines. He gave a great talk to our company a number of years ago on this whole thing. It's one of the reasons why Hawaiian Airlines is so successful. Um, but this is a global phenomenon. I think you all can also see it in your own lives, in your, in our, in your own offices. For example, in our office, it's not uncommon anymore particularly for our young people. What are you doing this weekend? I'm going to London. London? Yeah, I got a great deal on Norwegian. I'm going to go see my sister. I'm going to Buenos Aires. That's right. You know this kind of thing is happening. When I was out of college, a young person, it was a big deal to drive to San Diego for the weekend. But this is a huge global phenomenon. So next, next slide, please. The low price in airfare is not in isolation. In the entire travel sector, and the transportation annexing, if you will, we're shifting from a legacy economy here to a new economy. So I've got some examples here. KLM, uh, round trip from uh, New York City to Madrid. KLM, 422 bucks. Norwegian, 303. How about lodging? Marriott, 702 bucks total for a you know, one week trip. Airbnb, 372. How about ground transportation? Hertz, 144 bucks. Everybody uses Uber. I was just in Seoul, Korea four weeks ago at the auto conference. I used Uber in Seoul, Korea. I mean, I never would have thought this possible, but this new economy, as opposed to the legacy economy, is further feeding the travel propensity and the desire for people all around the globe to travel. Amazing. You've made a strong point about cheap airlines playing a huge role in the growth of passenger traffic. Are there other factors stimulating air traffic? Absolutely, if I get the next slide, please. One of the biggest uh, outgrowths of the low cost and ultra low cost uh, proliferation of airlines that's now actually being matched by the legacy carriers is the huge development of unique city pairs, point to point travel. Nobody wants to stop somewhere they don't need to stop. And the LCCs and the ULCCs have been the major driver before that. And so you can see this huge increase in the last 20, 25 in, in, in unique city pairs. And it's happening all across the globe. And you couple that with what we call the real transportation costs, which are actually going down over time. So convenience, going where you want to go at the time you want to go, is huge. And it's been another major contributor uh, to this factor. Let's, let's concentrate. Next slide, please. So the biggest growth area right now is Asia. So I just took some specific examples here. In Asia alone, which is, by the way, about 40% of where our business is, I've just pulled up just some typical low-cost carriers, all of which have started in the last 15 years. Um, you know, from Peach in Japan, it's hard for me to read some of this over, Indigo in India, Cebu Pacific in the Philippines, Jeju in, uh, in Korea, Spring Airlines in China. All these new routes have emerged just in Asia over the last 10 or so years. Next slide, please. It continues with very different uh, airlines. Air Asia, based at uh, Kuala Lumpur, Vietjet out of Vietnam, uh, Thai Air Asia, Lion Air, and, and it, these route expansions all over the largest growth area of the world is huge in point-to-point -point travel. A lot of positives out there. Do you see concerns over the trade wars, especially you know, what's going on with China? I mean, what, is, there, is there a dark cloud out there? So look, it's a serious thing. Um, and free and open trade uh, and fair trade has been a huge contributor to global growth um, uh, everywhere. Um, the rub of it always comes upon what is your definition of fair? That's really what this really comes down to in, in terms of our administration and, and that sort of thing. So um, I do think that uh, we see evidence 
today of impact, for example, in, in the transportation of goods. Federal Express just announced, made an announcement yesterday as earnings were down, et cetera, et cetera. The IATA reported cargo and traffic numbers have also been trending down, but the passenger numbers, the passenger numbers are still holding up and they're still holding up pretty strong. Because of the influences that I've already mentioned, the low cost of airfare, the, the convenience in going point to point, and huge development of city pairs, that airfare has gotten so cheap that in my view, it's gonna take a huge, a huge global movement and taking away of disposable impact to have any meaningful significance. Now that's not to mean things couldn't happen, travel ban, et cetera, et cetera. And I don't, I, I don't wanna be sounding too naive or optimistic here, but the fact of the matter is, as I hinted in my interview, at least from our company, we have not seen any evidence in terms of business coming into us from China or elsewhere that there has been any kind of a prejudice against our company. We're a US-based company. We're still delivering airplanes in the People's Republic of China. We're getting all kinds of RFPs. So while it is possible, it's hard to see on the passenger side, on the passenger side, uh, it's hard for me to see really any um, long-term effects. And by nature, I'm an optimist. I do think these global trade issues are gonna get settled because they're just too important to all of our economies. They're important to China. It's important to the United States of America. You know, there's some positive news this week. Uh, it could be negative news next week, who knows? But, so I don't wanna be glib about it. We're watching it very closely, but so far, at least for, for my business and our business, we're holding up okay. So last week with the Paris Air Show, it yielded less orders than Farnborough mm -hmm. the year before, and Farnborough was lower than Paris the year before mm -hmm. that. Um, do you think overall at the airlines here, Share your optimistic view, or are we becoming more cautious, or is the air show just not the place where people make orders any longer? So, you know, that's a good question. Um, so yes, maybe the total orders were down, but the surprise to me, and perhaps some of you, is that there was about 830 orders at this Paris air show in total. That was a surprise. I mean, I think everybody thought it was gonna be much more muted. I mean, we, we have the situation for the max, but even with the MAX situation, IAG stepped up and ordered 200 of them. I think it was a great credit to IAG and to the Boeing company. Um, so I think the first point is, while there is naturally a bit more, uh, I think, caution these days, um, I think the situation with the MAX has caused several airlines globally to reevaluate their growth plans. It's time for a recalibration year, perhaps, to see you know, where are we going. But at the end of the day, again, coming into what's coming into our shop, we are getting just as many requests for aircraft as we were a year ago. And so I think it's good. I mean, we have a huge uh, uh, strain in the supply chain in global commercial aircraft production. It still exists today. We can't keep having year after year of 2,000 aircraft orders uh, or 1,500 aircraft orders. So, my takeaway is I was surprised we had as many orders as we did, and you know, our company contributed to that. We, we have a very long-term view of things. Our orders now go out through 2026. We've never gone out that far before. But we do it for a lot of very good strategic reasons and that sort of thing. So I do think the airlines are taking a fresh look at things, but I can tell you we, we also announced a series of, a lot of series of lease placements uh, at the Paris Air Show. Uh, one notable one, we had 10 787-10s that we did in conjunction with the Boeing company that we announced on lease to Korean Air. They announced a bunch of 787-10s. So although for our order, the A321 XLR got a lot of splash because it's a new airplane, in fact, we announced a fair amount of Boeing business as well. So I think it's a year uh, where the airlines pause a bit and recalibrate, but I sense no long-term diminution in, in, in long-term confidence. So bringing this all together, and you look in that crystal ball, and I'd love to have your crystal ball. <laughs> what do you see in the future? I think what you see is right here on the slide. We see huge, significant opportunity for continued air travel expansion. If you just kind of take a look real quick, the top of this slide basically represents more of the developed countries uh, in, in the globe today. And they're the key drivers for people in those countries and, and in terms of their propensity to travel and fly is primarily the ease and affordability. The, the low airfares, the point-to-point -point travel, the, the ever-evolving city pairs, et cetera, et cetera. But I'd actually like to focus a little bit on the bottom of the chart. 
On the bottom of the chart are the more developing countries. As a matter of fact, and by the way, this is a propensity to fly by uh, per capita per year. The bottom 10 on that of countries on that slide represents half of the global population. Half of the world's population have had the smallest propensity to fly in terms of trips per capita on the globe. That is huge. That is absolutely huge, and that is why we see continued opportunity for continued air travel demand. And talking about the middle, uh, middle class, next slide, please. So just some interesting statistics we got from the Brookings Institute. So 160 million people per year, per year on average, are going to be added globally to the middle classes through 2030. It's the largest expansion in the middle class in the world's history. 88% of those, uh, of the next billion entrants into the middle class, will be in Asia. 88%. Vietnam, Thailand, Indonesia. Uh, I mean, it, it's absolutely huge. Um, and then if you look at big picture, um, almost $30 trillion more than was spent in 2015 will be spent and will be consumed by the global middle class by 2030. I mean, $30 trillion. Um, it's absolutely incredible. So if I could have uh, that next slide, please. So the bottom line, I think the reason, the point I, 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 of my talk today, this industry has always had headwinds. This industry has always had macro problems from since I can, since well before I joined this industry. I mean, this line is a line of global growth in revenue passenger kilometers, okay? So the little blue uh, regression line, that's the average line, et cetera. We've had kind of a general rule of thumb in this industry that uh, passenger growth doubles about every 15 years. So that's what the 2x is. Uh, and so we have two 2x periods, two doubling periods, at about 14 to 15 years each. But through all those times, we've weathered a Gulf crisis, the Asian financial crisis, 911, SARS, financial crisis. We have always had macro headwinds in this industry. Always, always, always. And yet, if you look at that line, yes, maybe one or two or three years, you have a leveling off of passenger traffic. But it's followed in almost every single case by an even more rapid growth in the following couple of years, so that we end up right here. And that's the trend line. The blue line is sort of the average regression now. We've been averaging well above the trend line for the last six years. I believe we will continue to do so. And this is why I'm so optimistic. And again, uh, with uh, those who were here last month, your message and John Slosser's are almost identical. It's, it's interesting that you had probably had no idea what John talked about. He, he basically delivered the same message, so that, that's encouraging. So what do you think the single biggest issue or the top one or two long-term issues facing global air, air transportation as we look to the future, John? If I had to cite one issue, so more medium term, um, everybody is, has an eye on global free trade. I. I I'm a little concerned about uh, World Trade Organization actions uh, between Boeing and Airbus. Um, we don't want a situation where, again, this comes down to every person's side uh, and view of what is fair. On the other hand, we don't want to have a situation where there's any limitations on Boeing air airplanes going into Europe or Europe's airplanes coming into Boeing. I think that'll get solved, but you know, I'm just mentioning a few things that are kind of on my mind. Global trade situation, again, is another big, big factor. But so far, I think, as I mentioned before, it's going to take a lot, a lot of discretionary income pullback to, to significantly influence these numbers. Probably the biggest single issue that I think we face as an industry, and in fact, uh, as the world over the next 20 years, is the environment. I can tell you more and more these days, if any of you read the annual reports of airlines like I do, and in fact in many other industries all over the world, environmental issues have become huge, absolutely huge. It's the main reason for all the new airplanes that we have out today, the MAX, the NEO, all the different variations with the, with the new engines. 
We're seeing for the first time, especially in Europe, a lot of consumer pressure on some airlines about environmental sustainability. I'm not going to fly on this airplane if it's not, if, if it's not environmentally sustainable. We have an industry-wide problem which IATA is addressing. Today, the average person on the street, when they look up and they see contrails, which we all know, hopefully in this room, is just water vapor, <laughs> they think it's pollution. So we have a huge challenge here. But the more that I travel everywhere, same thing in China, by the way, and, and Beijing. I mean, um, you think that the central party in Beijing likes to wake up and read the Asian Wall Street Journal and see somebody with a mask on their face in the central capital of Beijing uh, breathing a bunch of smoke and smog. These environmental factors, I believe, are going to be a huge driver in determination of aircraft selection, in taxation. Again, we're seeing a lot of this in nor Northern Europe carbon emissions, I believe this is probably the single longest term issue that we as an industry face. And one we've not seen before, so that's, Absolutely. that makes it even more challenging. Well, those are all the questions I have. I'll, I'll open it up to the audience. If Last anybody... slide, please. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you. thank you, John. Thank you. Right. So we have a few minutes if anybody wants to throw John a question. Ken? Ken. So does leasing mitigate the impact of tariffs in China? So does leasing mitigate the impact of tariffs in China? Um, I don't know that it mitigates it, but it still is a mechanism and a vehicle for Chinese airlines to obtain Boeing aircraft, specifically. Um, and as I said, we continue to deliver aircraft through the leasing. Uh, I mean, when you lease an airplane, you don't own it. You rent it for a period of time. And, and maybe, look, I, I can't speak for the government's view, and I'm not. I, I can only tell you what we see. And so far, the leasing channel has, I don't think, has really been significantly impacted uh, uh, by trade barriers that would influence not being able to import a Boeing aircraft, for example, into the People's Republic of China. So I probably stopped short of saying, is leasing the answer? I don't know if it's an answer. All I know is leasing is a mechanism that continues to work today to bring airplanes, and particularly Boeing airplanes, into China. Okay. Mike Lavitz from Aviation Week. Uh, what sorts of new technologies, you know, you're talking about sus environmental sustainability. Mm -hmm. 10 years from now, what sorts of technologies do you think will be in the airplanes you're buying then that aren't in the fleet now? Well, besides the obvious progress that we've made in the power plants, which are the biggest single changes uh, that we see today, you know, you've read about certain manufacturers wanting to incorporate electric hybrid technology. I think that's coming. Uh, I'm not exactly sure when, but uh, you know, Airbus has been pretty vocal about that in the last uh, couple of weeks. They uh, talked about it a lot in Paris. Um, I think that the way that uh, air is recycled in the cabins can go through uh, some some changes and in, in, in involvement in technology. Um, simple things like making the air traffic control more uh, system more um, friendly, being able to keep airplanes at high altitudes and to go direct towards their landing spot as opposed to being routed all over the place. That's, a, that's probably one of the single biggest things we could do to drive uh, better environmental sustainability is not have to fly so much. And the not having to fly so much having, has to do with all the routings and delays you see everywhere. I, I mean, that's, it's a global phenomenon. Um, you've all experienced it coming into Kennedy or LaGuardia. You know, you could be, you could be, you could be 100 miles out and you're vectored all over the place. So the ATC system, I think, itself uh, would be a huge contributor. So those are just a couple of examples. Time for one more question. Yeah. There we go. Thanks, uh, Joe Denardi at Stiefel. Um, John, when you look at kind of the order of books at Boeing and Airbus, mm -hmm. both airlines and some of your other lessors, how do you get comfortable that there's not, you know, too many orders there, there, there hasn't been any kind of over-ordering. Right. If I look at where we are today versus 15, 20 years ago, um, a couple fundamental shifts. Number one, most of the airlines today are either under private ownership or public ownership. They're gone for the most of the airline, are the, the public ownership of the airline. So we've seen, and we've seen it driven primarily here, first and foremost, the United States. The, the airlines have actually migrated to becoming profitable and focused on, on returning share to the sh uh, returning a, a good investment to the shareholders. So I think gone are the days where routes were protected at all costs. Today, 
if a roux is unprofitable, give it a go for a little while, but drop it. We're seeing more and more. So I think you're seeing a, a more um, rational capacity uh, decisions on the part of airlines globally, not just here in the United States. So in terms of the airlines themselves, I see more rationalization uh, and more and more capacity conscious control and less turf wars, I guess you would say. How about on the part of the manufacturers or the other side of the equation? Um, equally so, I think there's been a lot more growth and sophistication and discipline by the part of Boeing and Airbus, in fact, all the manufacturers looking at their skyline charts. Um, we all know, especially on the single out there, they're overbooked. I mean, just like the airlines. There are many, many uh, months of the year, both at Boeing and Airbus, where we look at the nerves of the year, there's over cladding. I mean, they, they can't, they promise more aircraft than they can deliver. So there is a constant migration within the skyline, both at Boeing and at Airbus. Things move around, things change. We, on our, all of our orders, we, it's a very routine thing for us to move. Yes, we have contractual delivery positions, but we all have strategic campaigns. And there's many, many reasons why we move and ebb and flow those order books. So I think don't think about the order books as cast in concrete. The order books have a flow to them, and they have a movement. And that movement uh, absorbs uh, places where there's a little, uh, you know, there's not too many these days, but where there might be some excess production capacity as against uh, months of the year when they're, uh, when they're just short of what they're supposed to do. So I think that discipline on the part of the manufacturers, and by the way, the engine, uh, all the suppliers, but the engine companies have a, have a much bigger say on this these days as well because they can only produce so much. So you look at the large supply chain, I think there's a focus on discipline, again, even on the supply chain side, return of investment to the shareholder. Um, and um, you don't see a lot of empty airplanes these days. I don't know about you folks, but, but you know, I mean, just think about your own experiences out there. Airplanes are largely full. That wasn't necessarily the case 20 years ago or 15 years ago. So I think overall, that discipline, that capacity management, both on the airline side as the buyers of aircraft and lessors as well, uh, and the Boeing side has proven to be positive. And while there may be some holes in the order book going forward, et cetera, et cetera, as a matter of fact, um, I think both Boeing and Airbus, especially on the single side, actually count on a few folks going away because there's still too many contractual commitments for aircraft than the current supply chain and production rate can provide. Very good. Well, thank you very much, John. All right. I'd like to present you with this plaque presented to John Pluger in grateful appreciation for your presentation at the Aviation Leader Series of the Wings Club Foundation, New York, June 2019. Thanks so much. Thank we you, really John. That was very nice. Thank you.